Thanks for joining us online. We'll get to the message shortly, but first, some encouraging words to get you through your week. One, one of the things that was was said this week that I just, I wanted to just kind of pass it on to you too, that I thought was pretty cool. It was pretty simple, but it was three things to do every day. And uh, the first thing was to value people. And I just thought how appropriate that is because that's what I think we're all about here at Abundant Grace, loving God and loving people. It's our mission. It's, right? Yeah, it's our mission. And we just, you know, if we put that first and foremost in our own personal lives every day, that we're going to value people, no matter who they are, where, you know, where they come from, what, what we think of them even, if we like them or not. But you still no place matter, no value. No matter what uh, political party they come from, yep, yep. whether they're donkeys or elephants. Yeah, it don't matter. You it still value people. That's right. We yeah. value everybody. <laughs> That's right. So Red, yellow, black, and white. Just reminding ourselves that we value everybody. Um, so that was number one, valuing people. And then the second thing was to spend time with lost people. So sometimes I think we get in our little bubble. We think we're surrounded by all of our church friends and our Christian friends. But it, how we need to get out and spend time with lost people, hang out with lost people, um, because we don't we don't know how to have compassion for them if we don't know where they're at and what they're doing. And, and how are they going to find the way that's if, right. if we're just going to keep it to ourselves, mm-hmm, you know? Mm-hmm. I know if, if we had the cure, if we came up with a vaccine or a cure for cancer, we would not keep it to ourselves. Right, right. They would be proclaiming that out. And so, you know what? We've got the answer. Mm-hmm. We've got we got the answer to joy, to hope, and all that stuff. And so we need to be out there sharing it because I'm telling you this, there's a lot, there's billions of people in our world that, that are looking for truth, that are looking for hope. Yeah. And so, you know, yeah, we, we have to, we just have to stay connected to people. Yeah. So value people, um, hang out with lost people. And the last thing was to live a life that is attractive. So what does your life look like? Is it, um, you know, what's your family life look like? What does your home life look like? What does your friends look like? What does your kids look like? Your Um, marriage. What does your marriage look like? Is that attractive, the way you live your life? Because if it's not, who's going to want to follow something that's not attractive? So it just was like, that makes complete sense, that we need to live a life that is attractive, that people are like, I want to be like that. I want to do that. Thanks again for joining us online. Now we'll get to the message. What does it mean to be a believer? What does it take for a lady like that every morning? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You see, it's been said that there are a lot of people that are going to miss heaven by 18 inches, 12 to 18 inches, because that's the distance from your head to your heart. You've heard that. A lot of people are going to miss heaven by 18 inches. You see, a lot of people that consider themselves Christians, even consider themselves believers, have head knowledge. They've got the head knowledge of what the Bible says, okay? But they don't have heart commitment to God. And so they're going to miss heaven because they don't understand the full meaning of the word believe. And I want to share a little bit about that today. One of my classes in Bible college, we had to take a a class on evangelism. And uh, in this class, we had to learn a way of sharing the gospel with people. And so part of our assignment, we, back in those days, video cameras, those big monster video cameras were coming out, okay? We had to take a video camera with the big VHS tapes in them. And we had to go and we had to record each other sharing the gospel with... uh, with people at the mall, just on the street. Cold turkey evangelism. Let me just say this. We didn't have a lot of conversions. <laughs> How many know that most conversions that happen, most people that accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, it's through relationship. It's through a family member or a friend. Okay, think about your life. I mean, if I did a poll, I would say that the majority of the people in this room came to that knowledge of Jesus because someone that you knew a friend or family member shared with you. And then there are some that have said, geez, they were watching TV, the TV miraculously turned on and there was a pastor speaking and you gave your life to Jesus. But most people come to know Jesus through relationship. And so I had this class and so we're going out. And so the opening question that we would say is, suppose you were to die today. Suppose you were to die today. How do you know that you'd be going to heaven? 
How do you know you'd make it to heaven? And many would respond, oh, because I'm a good person. I was a majority. I'm a good person. I do good things. Okay. Some would say, well, I, I believe there's a God. Okay, that's, that's good. Is there anything? Oh, yeah, I, I believe Jesus. I believe he died on the cross. Okay. Anything else? And so they would come up. They would have all these head answers, these 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 answers, they'd say all those things. And I think when we approach with people that people and they say that, we kind of, oh, okay, they believe in Jesus. Okay, everything's cool, right? I mean, I've been there. Oh, they believe in Jesus. Okay, that's, that's great. We leave it at that. But let me just say, would it surprise you if I told you that simply believing there is a God and that Jesus died on the cross is not enough to get into heaven? Oh, Pastor Dean, you're messing with our theology here. What if I told you that simply believing in your head that there's a God and that Jesus died on the cross? You know, it, let me ask you this. Do you believe in the devil? Do you believe there's a devil? Yes, okay. Do you think the devil is going to heaven? No. Do you know that the devil believes in God? And the, de the devil believes in Jesus? Do you know that the devil knows Jesus is the Son of God? And so, do we think Satan is going to be in heaven? So obviously, believing with a head only knowledge in God and believing with a head knowledge only in Jesus as the Son of God is not enough to get you in heaven because even the devil believes that. Does that make sense? Okay. So in other words, there's a difference from accepting the facts. I have the facts. Yeah, oh, Jesus, that's, it's a fact. Jesus is the Son of God. There's a fact. It's fact. God is real. There's a difference between accepting the facts versus trusting Christ with my life. You see what I'm saying? The heart commitment, the heart, going from the head to the heart. Some may be asking, you know, okay, Dean, where is that in the Bible? Man, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> James chapter 2, verses 19 through 24. It says this, You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. Verse 20, how foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless. Verse 21, don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Verse 22, you see his faith and his actions, they worked together. His actions made his faith what? Complete. How many want to have complete faith? Absolutely. Verse 23, and so it happened, just as the scriptures say, Abraham believed God. God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called what? Friend of God. Verse 24, so you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. Man. That's, that's interesting, isn't it? You know, Jesus also said in John chapter 5, verse 24, I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. Okay? So a, a person, people that are believing in this way with their heart, they're trusting Jesus with their eternal destiny. Okay, more than 60 times the New Testament tells us eternal life is given to those who put their faith, who put their trust, who have the, the heart commitment in Christ alone for salvation. You see, you got to go back to that Greek word, okay? In the New Testament, if you remember, the whole Bible was written in, okay, Old Testament Hebrew, New Testament Greek, and Aramaic. Okay, so if you go back to the Greek language that in this New Testament passage, to that word believe, okay, in the Greek New Testament, uh, the word believe is pistuo, pistuo, okay, and there it is, pistuo. And so 
Pistua actually means more than just knowing about something. It means to trust in, to cling to, to rely on, to adhere to, or to commit to. How many know that's a big difference between just head knowing and heart commitment, right? Okay, let's, let's illustrate this a little bit. How many realize that there's various levels of knowing and believing in people, right? Okay, let's, let's just think about it. For instance, there's a real shallow knowledge, okay? Now, I know, go ahead and put that picture up. I know about Justin Bieber. I think we all know about Justin Bieber, right? And so we, we all know Justin Bieber, but I don't know him personally, at least not yet anyway, right? Okay, I'm believing God's put a heart in me, my heart for Hollywood and the entertainment industry and I'm not letting go. But I don't know him personally, but I know who he is. Now, I believe that he exists, and I, but I've never given my life to Justin, right? I believe he exists. And a lot of people believe that Jesus exists but they've never given their life to him. They don't have personal relationship. Okay, let's kick it up a notch, okay? The next level of knowledge uh, we can have um, can be with our neighbors, okay? We, we, we know our neighbors exist. Some of us may even know their name. Okay, you can, you can take Justin off. It's creeping me out, okay? <laughs> I wish he was my neighbor. I mean, that would be cool. <laughs> but... The next level, okay, is our neighbors. We may know a little bit more about them. You may know their name, right? You may know where they work. You may know their, the names of their family members. You, you may know just a little bit more about them, okay? And so uh, we, we have a little bit more background, but you really, you may not really know your neighbor, okay? A little bit better than you would probably Justin, okay? But then there's a the next level. And that would be kind of like a spouse or a parent or a sibling or child. Okay, you know them very, very well, right? At least I hope you do. You see, I, I know my wife. I believe my wife. When I say I believe in Lori Wiles, it means that I know more that, than she just exists, okay? It, it means that I trust in my wife. I rely on on my wife. I have committed my life to my wife. And so I, oh, I know her in a, in a close, intimate way that I don't know anybody else because in four days we're going to be married for 27 years. Woo! How many know that's an accomplishment, right? I know I got married when we were two, but you know, it was an arranged marriage. My parents signed off. My third birthday, I got married. No. Okay. Just, then that's more like a worry. Okay. And I'm so excited. And let me just publicly say, it's been an honor for me to be your husband. Man, I, I just, I love you. And uh, couldn't imagine doing this without my wife. She just, she's, she means everything to me under Jesus. And so... That's the, she's the fourth person in the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and Lori. Okay. So uh, that's the kind, that's the, that's the meaning of that Greek word, uh, pastuo. Okay. It's, it's, it's supposed to be a U, but I wrote, I hand wrote it, and they put a V because it's me. My handwriting was bad. So anyway, okay, so it, it's you. So, um, it means to trust in, cling to, rely on, adhere to. Okay, so this morning, I want to just simply give you five actions of what it means to really believe in Jesus, okay? You may have been in church all your life, or this may be your first week in church, and you know about Jesus, but you've really never trusted in Him. So, I, I want to take these five actions of belief, and just for fun, I put them in an acrostic to firm, form the word trust, Okay? What does it mean to trust, to believe in Jesus? Okay, write this down. Number, the, the first letter, T, turn everything over to Jesus. What does it mean to be a believer? Believers turn everything over to Jesus. 
You see, I turn the good of my life, the bad of my life, the ugly of my life. I turn my past, my present, my future. I give him reign over my finances in my relationship. How many know I even put him in charge even of our of sex life? Every area of our life, my health, every area, I turn everything over to Jesus. Romans 10, 9 is one of the most important verses in the Bible. So if you don't get anything else today, get this verse. It says this, if you openly or if you confess with your mouth or openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You see, this is a promise of God. It doesn't say you might be saved or you hope you can be saved. You really wish you could be saved. It says you can count on the fact that you are going to heaven. You can know for certain, friend, that you are saved and that you are going to heaven if you do these two things. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is my Lord and believe, trust in my heart that God raised him from the dead. You see, most of us, maybe not all of us, have done the first part, we've openly declared, okay, we confess, yeah, okay, yeah, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Circle that word Lord. How many know that's not a word that we use so much anymore, right? We don't use it really in America like they do and because uh, we have a democracy, it's not a monarchy. And so in those lands where there's a monarchy, you know, the, the kings and queens and the lords and the ladies and knights and squires and all those, okay, that was a term that they used in a monarchy. And so we don't have that in America, so nobody goes around using, yes, my lord, as you wish, my lady, you know, we don't, we don't do that, okay? So we don't use this. And so we don't have a house of lords that we have representatives. And so what does that word lord really mean? For me to say, Jesus is my Lord. You see, it means he is my master. He controls me. He's the ruler. He's my boss. God is my boss. He's in control of, of everything. In my, he's not just resident in my life. He's president of my life. And when I say Jesus is my Lord, I'm saying Jesus is the CEO of my life. He's the chairman of the board of my life. He's the one that's calling the shots. He's my manager. He's the owner. He's the director. He is my God. He is the GM, okay? How many have ever uh, seen a sign on a business that says under new management? What does that mean? It means the old boss is gone and there's a new boss and a new system, right? How many know when you truly believe in Jesus, not head knowledge, but heart knowledge, you should have a sign put on that says, I'm under new management. I'm under new management because that's what it means to make Jesus the Lord of our life. All of a sudden, he's in control of my words. He's in control of what I watch, what I listen to, what I do. He's now in control of all those areas. I'm no longer the Lord of my life. I'm not calling the shots anymore. He's calling them. He's in control. And I'm not, in, he's the boss. And so we're going to just simply follow him. You see, God is God. We're not. God is God and we're not. So the first part of believing means I say Jesus is my Lord. He's my boss, my manager. I'm under new management. Growing up, I don't know, maybe you guys have seen this, but there were bumper stickers on cars that say, God is my co-pilot. Have you, have you seen those? Well, there's a problem with that. God doesn't want to be your co-pilot. He doesn't want to say, okay, you control the plane half the time and then I'll control the plane half the time, okay? You run your life half the time, I'll run the life half the time, okay? He wants total control. How many know what I'm talking about? God has a right to total control in our life because guess what? He made us. He loved us. Jesus died on the cross so that we could have relationship. How many think he deserves control of our lives? And he loves us so, so much. So he has a right. He doesn't want to be just a co-pilot. He wants to be the Lord manager. So, okay, turn everything over to Jesus. To be a believer, we turn everything over to Jesus. Second thing that we have to do is we relax in his love. Letter R, relax in his love. What does it mean to be a believer in Jesus? It means I relax in his love. And I think that's so awesome. 
relaxing. Let me explain this. The word relax, we use that, we have to use that word intentionally because the opposite of relaxing in my mind is we're working, right? Working, 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 working. But a true believer is one that can relax in their relationship with Jesus. In other words, God is saying, you don't have to work for God to love you. You don't have to earn God's love. He's already given. You just have to receive it. We relax in God's love, right? Did anyone grow up with conditional love? You got conditional love maybe from your parents or your partners, your pal, your professionals, all the people around you. In other words, you wanted to be loved. You had to do certain things. You had to spend most of your life trying to earn the love of other people. And you wanted to be loved. But, and there's nothing wrong with that because you need love in your life. You wanted to be loved, but you spent most of your life trying to earn the love of other people. And you had to work for that love. And let me just say, when you believe and when you trust in Jesus, you can relax, my friend, and realize that God is going to love us no matter what. No matter what. I don't have to earn his love. I don't have to work for his love. I don't have to pay for his love. God is going to love me unconditionally. And friends, it will never, 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 ever change. God doesn't love you one day and then the next day zaps you with lightning. No, he loves you every single day. He's not finicky. God is not fickle. He doesn't have a bad hair day. Okay? God loves you unendingly. And once you have the love of God in your life, it never, never, never will leave you no matter what you do because God's love is based on what Jesus did on the cross for you and in the tomb for you. You can't make God stop loving you, my friend. You can try, but you will fail because God's love is unconditional, unwavering, and unending. God's love is forever. God's love is forever. Okay, we got, is this boring or? Okay, okay, here we go. I don't know if you're sleeping or whatever. That, how many know that his love forever, that gives me enormous confidence. Enormous confidence when I believe in Jesus, it means I believe in what Jesus said about God's love for me and I can relax in his love. And that gives me confidence. A lot of other people may not like me, but the creator of the universe loves me and that gives me confidence. Let me show you what the Bible says about this. Bring up Romans 8, 35 through 39. It says this, a passage you're all familiar with, but you, I just want to encourage you this morning. The enemy's been whispering crap to you all week long. And I just, I want to give you some hope here. Look at this verse. If your neighbor's sleeping, nudge him. Say, pay attention. Can anything ever separate us from, the, from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or if we're persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or even threatened with death? It says this, as the scriptures say, for your sake, we're killed every day. We're being slaughtered like sheep. These guys, they're being persecuted, right? What else does, the, it goes on and says, no, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us, right? Verse 38, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death, go ahead, take my life, neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers, the Bible says of what? The powers of hell. hell right? Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. There ain't no power in, you know. That, does that give you confidence? What can separate you from the love of God? From God's love that he's given to you? What? Nothing. So, man, we got confidence to believe in Jesus means I accept what he says about God's love for me. I relax in his unconditional, unending love. The next action of what it means to really believe in Jesus, okay? We turn everything over to God. We relax in his love. The you, 
is use my life to serve God by serving others. A true believer will use our life, use my life to serve God by serving others. I'm telling you, you want to honor me as a dad, you honor my kids, man. When you honor my kids, I am so blessed by that. And by when we go and we serve one another, we start thinking about other people. We start serving them. Man, we're serving God. It's, it's, it's pretty, pretty cool. To believe in Jesus, I'll use my life to serve God. Okay, Jesus didn't come to earth and die on a cross and pay for all of our sins so that we could live a selfish, self-centered life that's all about you. Unfortunately, a lot of people, they're depressed, they're discouraged, and all this stuff. Why? Because they're thinking about themselves, they're being selfish. Do you think that God created you just to go to school, work, make money, and die, and live totally for yourself? Really? What's the logic in that? Do you think that God made you just to live for you? Absolutely not. You were made for so much more than to live for yourself. And God has far bigger plans for your life than that. Part of that purpose, friend, is to serve God while you're here on earth. You may say, wait a minute, okay, Dean, how in the world do I do that? How, how can I serve God? I can't even see him. How do, you, how do you serve an invisible God? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked. How do you serve an invisible God? <clears throat> Let me just say this. One day we're going to, we're all going to stand before him in heaven one day. We may not see him now, but God wants us to learn to live by faith on earth. That's part of it. Faith pleases God. How do I serve a God that I can't even see? Jesus said many times we serve God by serving others, by serving others. He said, even if you give a cup of cold water to someone who's thirsty, you do it in the name of Jesus. He says, that's as if you did it to me. You serve God by serving others. We, we give unto God as we give to others. You see, you were put on this planet to make a difference, friend. And let me say that again. The enemy, I just believe there's some in here, he's been whispering things otherwise. You were born, you were made, you're on planet right now, this day, 2019, to make a difference. And that difference is called good works. It's also called your service. In the Christian world, we call it ministry, <laughs> right? God puts you here for a ministry, for a service, for good works, to make a difference with your life. Not necessarily a big flashy difference, but to make a difference and leave the world a better place. The Bible says, uh, and let me show you Romans 6, 13. The Bible says this, do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead but now you have new life. Use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. You want to be happy? Give your life to Jesus and, and serve and use your life for his purposes. I'm telling you, when you live for yourself, you're really living for the enemy and your life is going to suck. I'm telling you. Okay? There's no greater thrill than to be a tool in the hand of God and used for his purposes. You know, if you've ever had that feeling of being used by God, you know how cool this is, right? Man, it's awesome. It's what I was made for. This is me. This is why I'm living. God made us for this, and it gives us significance. It gives us satisfaction, and it gives us more power than anything. That, I mean, more thrill, just more, uh, more fulfillment than we'll ever get from any amount of wealth, sex, power, pleasure, anything else. You were made for significance, and that significance comes from serving something greater than yourself. You were made to live for God and to serve other people. Are you serious? Okay, is it cool if I get a little unplugged with you? Okay, a little Dean unplugged here. Can I, can I, can I tell some truth? Okay, some of you are looking at your neighbor like, oh, snap, here he goes. Yeah. And I say this with all love. Here we go. If I claim to be a believer of Jesus, but I have no desire at all to serve Jesus, and I have no desire at all to serve humanity, to serve God by serving others, then I have every reason to doubt that I'm actually a believer. Wow. Woo! 
I might think that I'm a, I'm a believer, but I really wasn't. And that's my, something that, that scares me. When that verse, many will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these things? And he's like, I never knew you. Man, I, I, when, when that day comes, I want to stand before Jesus and hear him say, well done. And I want that for every single one of you here. You know, because if you're a true believer in Christ, it changes your motivation. You can't have an encounter with Jesus and stay the same, my friend. Whenever we have an encounter with God, man, it changes us. It changes our want to. It changes our attitude. All of a sudden, you don't want to live for yourself anymore. You want to live for something that's greater than yourself. The Bible says in James chapter 2, again, that first verse, and I'll just read it. It may not come up on the screen. If people say they have faith but do nothing, their faith is worth nothing. Can a faith like that save them? The answer is no. That's why by only accepting the fact, head knowledge, that Jesus is the Son of God is not going to get you to heaven. That's not true belief. If they say they have faith but do nothing about it, their faith is dead. It's worth zero. Nothing. The Bible says it. Let me show you another verse. Ephesians 2.10. You can put that one on there. For we are God's masterpiece. Ephesians 2.10. We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things He planned for us. When? Long ago, right? God has made us what we are, the Bible says, and in our union with Christ, that means by believing in Him, He's created us for a life of good works. The good thing that God wants you to do with your life, which He prepared for us to do long, long ago. Did you know that before you were born, God decided the good things He wanted to do with your life? Did you know that when He was making elephants and making trees and separating the land from the water, He knew you? And he already, he, was, he had plans for what he was going to create you at the time he was going to create you and the plan that he had for your life. Does that kind of freak you out a little bit? Does that blow your mind like God, all-knowing, all you know? It's like crazy. But here's the thing. You can miss God's purpose for your life. You can miss it. And the fact is, many people miss God's purpose for their life. You see, God's not going to force you to follow His purpose. He's a gentleman. He's not going to force you. He's going to say, here's the plan. But you have free will. You have a choice. In fact, okay, the greatest tragedy in life is not death. The greatest tragedy in life is to miss your purpose. To waste your life and not be the woman that God intended for you to be. To not be the man that God intended for you to be. That's a tragedy. How many understand you can make a million bucks and still be a failure at life? You could still be the top leader in the world and still be a failure at life because you've missed the idea of serving God by serving other people. There's a fourth letter. And that's the letter S. And before I give it to you, let me just explain a little background because it's kind of hard to understand this one. So I want to set the stage. Okay, I don't want any eggs being chucked at me. Jesus, how many would say was God in human form? Would you all agree with that? Jesus was God in human form. Okay, how many would say Jesus lived a perfect life? Okay, how many would say he never sinned? Yep. He never made a mistake. He never made any errors in his life because he was God. That's why he could pay for your sin because he was the perfect sacrifice, right? We believe that. But even though Jesus was perfect, not everybody liked him, right? Didn't even do anything wrong. He was perfect. And there were still people that were like, they didn't like him, okay? There were people, there were some that even thought Jesus, I mean, they, they disagreed with him. They accused him of things. They misjudged him. They hated him. Do you believe that there were people that wanted him dead? Absolutely, we know. But wait a minute. Are you telling me that even if I was perfect, some people aren't going to like me? Ding! Revelation! How many, <laughs> I'm sure you've all figured that one out by this time. You can be perfect, Jesus was, and there are people who wanted him dead. Why? Because evil hates good. Evil hates good. Darkness 
does not, can't be around light. Okay? Wrong does not like right. So if God says you're going to be a believer in Jesus, you should expect the same reactions from people that Jesus got. But why are we so afraid of that? We want to live very careful because we want to please everybody. We don't want to offend any. And we're so wrapped up in what other people think. Friend, what about what did, what did God think about us? What does God think? You know, because when you do what's right, people who want to do what's wrong will get upset with us. And they'll start making up stuff and start making accusations. Well, aren't you, you know, and they'll just say all these kind of things. Jesus faced it. We're going to, let me give you an example. Let's say your boss comes to you and, and he says, okay, we've got a new strategy, new program for our business. Uh, we're going to do, but we're, we're going to do a little bit of cheating. We're going to stretch the truth a little bit. We're going to lie just a little bit. Um, we're going to steal in order to make this company go forward. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you to do these things. And then you say, um, I'm sorry, boss, but that's kind of out of my character as a follower of Jesus. You know, I've surrendered my life to bring glory to God by doing the right thing and telling the truth. So, you know, sir, I, I can't do that. Do you think your boss is going to be happy with your answer? Do you think your boss is going to give you a promotion for having integrity? <laughs> Do you think that boss is actually going to hurt you or cause you suffer in some kind of way? In all likelihood, yes. You might get overlooked for the next promotion, right? You might even get fired. You may even get put out of the company. People suffer all the time for doing the right thing because they're Christians. Let's say tomorrow, students, you're at lunch. Five or six people start talking trash and gossiping, being, you know, rude and vulgar and just being mean about someone, and you start thinking in your head, you know, this is not the kind of conversation that I want to be in, involved in. And so you kind of just ninja style, get up and kind of slip out. And as you're walking away, you don't say anything, you just kind of walk away. Let's say one of those friends comes to you and says, hey, wait a minute, why did you lead the conversation? And then you tell them, hey, well, you know what? Uh, my pastor talked about uh, being a believer on Sunday, and you know, I, I, I'm a follower of Jesus, and I just really don't feel comfortable talking that way about other people. What do you think their reaction is going to be? Good for you, right? Man, that was awesome. Yeah, man, that's, so, that's, that's great. What are they going to say to you is probably, oh, oh, well, aren't you so righteous? Or aren't you so goody-goody? You know, they're going to start thinking, well, you are, you're just better than the rest of us. You're such a goody two-shoes. Okay, you're a Christian. You think you're better than all of us. And they'll start, hey, look at the church boy. Look at, man. And they'll just start saying these different things. What's happening? They're feeling guilty and they're putting it on you. I think a lot of times when we get criticized, they're feeling guilty, right? And so they don't like that. So they're going to put the guilt on you. They're going to blame you. And so you actually suffer for doing the right thing, not doing the wrong. And that's the fourth action that it means to believe in Jesus. S stands for suffer for doing what's right. Because believing in Jesus isn't always convenient, is it? Can anyone testify to that? Living for Jesus, is it always comfortable? No. Man, you see, as your pastor, I want, I want to tell you the truth. And the truth is, following Jesus Christ is not for wimps. Following Jesus is not for weak people. It's not for wimpy people. It's not for people who are wishy-washy. Believing in Jesus will demand more courage than you could possibly imagine. Because it's not always the popular right thing. It's not always popular standing for truth. It's not always easy or comfortable or convenient. You could be persecuted. You could suffer. You could be criticized. You, you could be, you know, made fun of. In fact, in some countries, you could use their life. We're seeing, I looked at the headlines already. There was another church in California, a synagogue, where a shooter went in and killed some people. I mean, it's happening, guys. Look at Sri Lanka. It's, it's not just in other countries. It's in this country too. Do you realize when we come in here and we have pre-service prayer back in the, in the unit room, we're praying God protect this place. We don't know. I believe we're doing some things to upset the kingdom of darkness, right? So it's happening. We're going to be persecuted. Jesus was, was honest about this. He said, if you want to follow me, you have to take up your cross, right? And let me ask you, if tomorrow they made it against the law to be a follower of Jesus in America, 
all of a sudden it's against the law to be Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Would there be enough evidence to convict you? Would anyone know that you are actually a true follower, that you are a believer? You see, have you turned your life over everything to Jesus? Just to say, oh, I'm a believer isn't enough. We have to turn everything over to Christ. We have to relax in his love. We have to use our life to serve something bigger than ourselves. And let me ask, are you willing to suffer for what's doing right? Philippians 1.29, for you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. It's a privilege that nobody wants to talk about. And let me just be up front. Being a Christian is not for weak people. It's not for wimps. It's for strong, courageous people. So, 1 Peter 3, 14. Even if you suffer for doing what's right, God will reward you for it. And by the way, that reward is going to go on and on and on in eternity. Okay? Far longer than any criticism, right? So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Can I just encourage it? Don't worry. Don't be threatened by their threats. And the fifth way of what it means to believe in Jesus, the last T is this, trust what he says. Trust what he says. Trust what he says. I trust what Jesus says. And if Jesus says, do it, then guess what? I do it. I do it. And if Jesus says, don't do it, guess what? I don't do it. What I don't do is pick and choose from the Bible. I don't say, you know, I like that verse, so I'm going to follow that verse. I don't like that one, so I'm not going to follow that one. I I like that command, so I'll follow that one. I don't really like that command, so I'm not going to follow that one. You know, I like that promise. Oh, man, that's a good promise. I'm going to hold on to that one. Ooh, wait a minute. Let me just say this. A true believer doesn't pick and choose parts of the Bible to, to live by. A true believer says, God said it, so here we go. In the Bible, we have the commands of Jesus and we have the promises of Jesus. The commands are, if you do these things, life's going to go a whole lot easier for you. Work will go easier. Marriage will go easier. Parenting will go easier. If you just do it God's, the way God says, because God knows what will make you happy more than you do. Then, okay, so there's the commands, but there are also the promises so that when you're going through tough, dark days, the days of doubt, the days of depression, the days when you can't see forward, you hold on to those promises. We all like the commands, but we also have to hold on to the promises because the promises are for those hard times, right? The Bible says in Psalm 33, 4, for the word of the Lord holds true and we can trust everything he does. We trust him. The question, here's a little quiz. How many of you believe and trust everything you read in the newspaper? (laughs) How about everything you read or see on the internet? Okay. Anything you, on TV? Okay. Then why do we spend more time believing and listening to something we don't believe in than something we do believe in? Why do we fight just to get five minutes of reading God's word that we do believe in? And sometimes we don't even get that in each day, but yet we're going to check our Instagram account or see what's going on in Facebook. Okay. I know, get off the soapbox, right? Hebrews 6, 18 says this, so God has given both his promise and his oath. Those two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold the hope that lies before us. There are some things God can't do, and one of those things is God cannot lie. It's impossible for him to lie. Over 7,000 promises in the Bible. Basically, they're blank checks waiting for you to cash, okay? Let me wrap it up in in just a couple minutes here. But I I really want to have a heart-to-heart talk to you as I close this. I want to talk to those here that may be straying away from God. God's just put on my mind lately as I've been praying that our mission is to restore the strain. To restore the strain. And I just want to talk to those that may be in the room that may be straying away from God. I, I want to talk to those who have had faith in the past, but you feel that you've lost it. 
he walked away. And we all know people like this. We have friends, neighbors, loved ones, family members. We have relatives who have had faith in Jesus in the past, had faith in God but in the past, but they walked away and said, you know what, I don't, have to, I, I don't want anything to do with God anymore. Okay? I don't believe anymore. You see, what caused people to lose their faith? You see, in a world when circumstances don't turn out the way that I want them to, there are a lot of people that say, you know what, forget you, God. It didn't turn out the way that I wanted. It didn't turn out the way that I thought it was going to be. So God, forget you. And then we want God who's a genie, who does everything our way. If he doesn't do what we want, we get all ticked off and we walk away. And we expect, you got to do what I say. Who answers every, we want him to answer everything our way. We want God to serve us instead of us serving God. Pain can cause people to lose their faith. As a pastor, I've talked to many people in pain. And I know people who've lost their faith because of abuse. I know of people who's lost their faith because of betrayal and adultery and divorce. I know people who have lost their faith because of bad business deals. And it broke their heart. I know people who have lost their faith because they prayed that a loved one wouldn't die and that person died. I know people who have lost their faith because they prayed for something to happen or not to happened. They prayed and they prayed and they prayed and year after year and it just was never answered. And then they said, forget you God. And then they walk away. Yet at the same time, we all know people who've gone through unspeakable suffering, far worse than any of us in this room have ever experienced. Unspeakable suffering, unspeakable pain, and yet their faith grew stronger. They grew closer to God. Their lives became more beautiful, not more broken and more bitter. Well, what made the difference? Why is it that you can take two people, put them in the exact same circumstance, same pain, same unexplained tragedy, one person will run away from God, the other person will run to God. You see, if you are in a tragedy right now, my friend, I highly recommend you not run from God. Get your eyes off yourself and run to God because there are no answers out there in the world that you're looking for. You got these answers that you want explanation. You will not get them. You're not going to get them. And you're not going to get any comfort out there too. Okay, when you're in pain, always run to God, even when you don't understand it. Run to God because he's the one who can comfort you. We always want God to explain everything, my friends. But God doesn't owe us an explanation or or an explanation for everything that happens to us. And on top of that, let me just say, even if you got the explanation, it wouldn't bring you comfort. I guarantee it. Even if you knew the reason why this happened, explanations don't comfort. The comfort of God is what comforts us. Listen, if something happened to Lori and she passed away all of a sudden and I knew the reason why she died, it wouldn't make it any less painful, would it? Explanations never comfort. But when we go through tragedy and we're going, why God, why God, why God? And you're not you're not going to know, but there are some things we're just not going to know on this side of eternity. But when we get to heaven, God will lay it all out and we'll look at it. And all of a sudden we'll say, ah, now I know why. Now I see. God specializes in bringing good out of bad. And not everything that happens in the world is good, my friend. We know that. There's a lot of bad in the world. Not everything that happens in the world is God's will. And people say, well, it must have been God's will. He took that person from me. He could have stopped it. Well, it must have been God's will that that person got murdered. No, it wasn't God's will. God has a will. Satan has a will. And you have a will. So stop blaming God for your bad decisions or someone else's bad decisions. Stop blaming God for the things that the enemy has done. If I went out this afternoon and I got trashed, and it was involved in a car accident and killed three people, that wouldn't have been God's will. That would be my will. So don't blame God. Stop blaming God. 
God could easily get rid of all the evil in the world. I know. How? Get rid of you. Get rid of me. Get rid of people, right? Everyone that he's given freedom to. God does not force you to do good. You're made in his image, so you have freedom to choose. And we typically choose the wrong thing and people get hurt. But God specializes in bringing good out of bad. Anybody can bring good out of good, but he turns crucifixions into resurrections. And one day we will understand that. But I suffer for what's right and I trust what he says, but I know that God wants me to turn from him to him in my pain. So why is it that so many don't? When some people go through suffering, they shrivel up, they get hard, they get cold, they get angry, they get bitter. The rest of their life, they're bitter, angry, and they make everybody around them bitter and angry. So what's, what's the, that's the, it's just the wrong way to respond. And like I said, there's other people that face the same things, but they handle things differently. They live, they turn to God. You see, everything in your life is a gift of God's goodness. You see, if God was not a good God at all, all that would be in the world and universe would be evil. And we know that there's evil in the world. We know there's a lot of bad. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of heartache. But we also know that in this world, there's a lot of good. There's a lot of beauty. There's a lot of beautiful things. The sun that shines, the colors, relationships, love. Because God is a good God. Then I know that God loves me more than I ever will be able to comprehend. At least not until I get to heaven and get a bigger brain. Okay? <laughs> You may be going through days of darkness and depression and doubt. I dare you, my friend, right now, to believe in God again. I dare you to believe in God. You may be going through some days of worrying. I dare you to be a believer in God. You may be going through days of confusion. You go, man, I don't even have the slightest idea what I should be doing with my life, where I should be going, what's up, what's down. I dare you to become a believer and to believe in God. You may be going through days of grief and your heart's just ripped wide open. Friend, I dare you to be a believer in God. Run to God, not away from Him, and you'll find the comfort that you can't get anywhere else. My last verse is this. The Bible says, John 1, 12, but to all who believed, heart commitment, trust, to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. How many want to be a children of God? Would you stand with me today? <clears throat> Believe and accept. But to all who believed and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. I believe he is God and I receive him as the Lord of my life. Friend, will you trust him today? Maybe you're here today and some things that were said kind of hit you right in the heart and you realize, if you're honest, you're not living for God. Maybe you've been running and you say, you know what, Dean? Thanks for caring enough to share with me those things and I realize that I made a mistake and I need to turn to God. I've been leaning on my own understanding. I need to trust Him. Dina, I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life again. I say good for you. I'd love to pray with you. And I'm just going to ask you, even right now, with, with everyone with your heads bowed, your eyes closed, I don't want to do anything to embarrass anybody, but I'm just going to say this, you're amongst family and friends. And if you can't be open in a decision to accept Jesus in front of people here, it's going to be hard to do that when you get outside these walls. But how many would be here and say, you know what, Dean, today's the day that I want to give my life to Jesus. Maybe for the first time, maybe for the 14th time. But you realize you've been doing things your own way and today's a new day. I want to be a true believer touch you, just wave at me. 
all across the room. Uh huh. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Anybody else? Today's the day. I want to be a believer. You know what? Let's just let's just say a prayer all together. The prayer doesn't make us saved. Your response right now is what your decision, your choice right now to live for him, that's what gets it. So let's just say this prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to trust you with my life. Forgive me of my sins. Make me new. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I want to be a believer. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name. Lord, I just pray for each one that prayed that prayer today. God, that you would continue to make yourself real to them. God, that you would bless them. And, and, and Lord, I'm just so thankful for the decisions that were made today. Probably at least eight hands went up today. God, you know what you're doing. And I just thank you that you leave the 99 and you go after the ones. God, thank you that you are restoring the straying. Thank you that you're sending the life raft out to those that need to be rescued. You are a good, good God. And I pray your blessing over every single person here. Church, let me bless you today. And again, we say this not as a tradition, but God instructed Moses to tell, to put the name, his name upon the people. And so he spoke this blessing. And I want to speak that over. I want to put the name of God over you. Church, that's you. May the Lord bless you this week, even this day. May he keep you. May he protect you. May he, you continue to sense his honor in your life. May you continue to see his grace and mercy in your life. May you continue to see his blessings in your life. May the confidence of God be on you through his Holy Spirit, that when you leave this place, as you go into your mission field, that you're going to walk out of here confident, knowing that God's love will never leave you, and that he's going to look out for you, and he's going to help you. Be confident, and be excited to be adopted sons and daughters of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And may the Holy Spirit's power be upon you, and may you walk in victory this week, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, Lori and I, we love you. We believe in you. Thank you for coming. Again, thank you each one that maybe this was your first week. Welcome. We're honored to have you. We look to see you again. All right. God bless you guys. You're awesome.